Welcome to Vet Image Lab. In this lecture, we'll walk through a practical, step-by-step -step echocardiographic protocol for evaluating myxomatous mitral valve disease in dogs. This is the first of a two-part series. In this session, we'll focus on what to evaluate from the right-sided scan, and in the next lecture, we'll cover the left-sided scan. And at the end of the series, we'll put it all together to build a complete echocardiographic checklist for MMVD. Sounds good? Let's get started. Myxomatous mitral valve disease, or MMVD, is the most common acquired heart disease in small breed middle aged to older dogs. It's a chronic progressive degeneration of the mitral valve, where the leaflets gradually thicken due to myxomatous changes. These changes lead to mitral valve prolapse, and over time, to mitral regurgitation. As a result, blood flows backward into the left atrium during systole, causing volume overload on both the left atrium and left ventricle. Because this process progresses gradually and often silently, a systematic echocardiographic protocol is essential for accurate staging and monitoring of the disease. American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine, or ACVIM, provides a widely used staging system for MMVD. This system helps us determine the severity of the disease and decide when to start treatment. In stage A, dogs are at risk but have no current heart disease. Stage B1 refers to dogs that have a heart murmur, but the left atrium and left ventricle are normal in size. At this stage, we simply monitor the patient without starting any medication. In stage B2, the disease has progressed and the heart is starting to remodel in response to volume overload, so we can see enlargement of the left atrium and left ventricle. In these dogs, treatment is typically started to delay the development of heart failure. Stage C is when the dog shows clinical signs of congestive heart failure, usually caused by pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema results from elevated left atrial pressure. At this stage, medications are used to control symptoms and maintain quality of life. Stage D includes dogs that have advanced heart failure that no longer responds well to standard treatment. As you can see, this staging system directly reflects structural changes in the heart, especially in the left atrium and ventricle. Therefore, echocardiography is essential for evaluating these changes and guiding treatment. Echocardiography allows us to assess both structural changes and hemodynamic function. So, we use three fundamental modes, two-dimensional mode, or 2D, for assessing internal structure, M mode for analyzing cardiac motion over time, and Doppler mode to evaluate hemodynamic changes. Let's briefly review the key structures of the left heart that we'll evaluate on echocardiography. We'll focus on the left atrium, mitral valve and chordae tendineae, the left ventricle, including the papillary muscles, the interventricular septum, and the left ventricular free wall. Blood enters the left atrium, passes through the mitral valve, and fills the left ventricle during diastole. During systole, it is ejected through the left ventricular outflow tract, or LVOT, into the aortic valve and systemic circulation. The LVOT is an anatomic corridor located between the interventricular septum and the anterior mitral leaflet. Now, just like in real clinical practice, we're going to examine each standard echocardiographic view step by step, from the right parasternal long axis, right parasternal short axis, and left apical window focusing on what specific features must be evaluated in that image and what characteristic changes we expect to see in cases of MMVD. Let's start from the right parasternal long axis view. In the four chamber right parasternal long axis view, we can see the left ventricle, left atrium, mitral valve, and the mitral annulus at the junction between the left atrium and left ventricle. The mitral annulus is a fibrous ring that forms the attachment point for the mitral valve leaflets. In this view, the first thing we evaluate is the shape of the mitral valve. The valve should appear sharp and linear, forming a clear border between the left atrium and left ventricle. This morphologic evaluation must be performed during diastole, when the valve is fully open and relaxed. In dogs with myxomatous mitral valve disease, the mitral valve leaflets become thickened and often show nodular irregularities along the leaflet margins, reflecting underlying myxomatous degeneration. Next, in the systolic phase, we evaluate whether the mitral valve closes properly. 
In a normal heart, the valve leaflets form a straight, continuous closure line, with no gap and no bulging into the left atrium. So as you can see here in this illustration, in a normal heart, the anterior and posterior mitral valve leaflets coapt tightly during systole. When you draw a line along the mitral annular plane, the leaflet tips should meet at this line without protruding into the left atrium. But in cases of MMVD, the mitral leaflet bows or billows into the left atrium during systole, while the tip still remains at or very near the annular plane. This finding is called mitral valve prolapse. Such incomplete coaptation between the anterior and posterior leaflets creates a central gap resulting in mitral regurgitation. Let's take a closer look at mitral valve abnormalities seen in MMVD, specifically prolapse, and flail leaflet. Mitral valve prolapse must be clearly distinguished from a flail leaflet. In prolapse, the leaflet bulges into the left atrium during systole, but the leaflet tip remains at or near the annular level. However, in flail movement, which typically occurs secondary to chordal rupture, the leaflet tip is no longer anchored and flips freely into the left atrium. In the illustration, you can see that the tip crosses far beyond the annular line, which is clearly different from what we see in prolapse. On the ultrasound image, the tip of the anterior mitral valve leaflet, highlighted here, moves abnormally into the left atrium, and the ruptured chordae can also be seen, floating without any tension. Do you see the flail movement of the mitral valve leaflet in this video? Watch closely for the leaflet tip that moves uncontrollably into the left atrium. This kind of unrestrained motion is what defines a flail valve, and it's often associated with more severe mitral regurgitation. Now let's move on to the third point. In this four-chamber view, you should assess the left ventricular chamber and the wall thickness. Specifically, check the relative thickness of three components, the right ventricular wall, the interventricular septum, and the left ventricular free wall. You can see how the right ventricular wall is much thinner than the septum and the LV free wall. So normally the ratio is approximately 1 to 2 to 2, or in some dogs, 1 to 3 to 3. You should also evaluate the size of each ventricular chamber in this view. Normally, the right ventricular cavity is approximately one-third the size of the left ventricle. Now let's move on to the interventricular septum, or IVS. In a normal heart, the IVS appears relatively flat and straight in the long axis view. But in cases of left ventricular volume overload, like in dogs with mitral regurgitation, you may see the IVS bowing toward the right ventricle. Finally, in this four-chamber view, we use color Doppler to check for mitral regurgitation. In this image, the mosaic flow pattern with multiple colors indicates turbulent blood leaking backward into the left atrium during systole. The presence, direction, and extent of this color jet help estimate the severity of mitral regurgitation. We'll discuss this further in the left apical view in more detail. Now let's take a look at the right parasternal long axis, LVOT view. This view is obtained by applying a slight cranial angulation from the four-chamber view. This window clearly shows the aortic root aortic valve, left ventricular outflow tract, mitral valve, and left atrium. In this LVOT view, just like in the four-chamber view, you can also evaluate mitral regurgitation using color Doppler. The regurgitant jet is again visible here as a mosaic flow into the left atrium. Now let's rotate the probe 90 degrees from the long axis view. This gives us the right parasternal short axis view at the level of the papillary muscles. You can see the left ventricle in a circular cross section surrounded by the free wall and the interventricular septum. Here, we assess the symmetry of the left ventricle, both in shape and contraction. The left ventricular wall should contract evenly, maintaining a round shape throughout systole. In this view, performing M mode is important. As you can see in this illustration, when you place an M-mode line across the left ventricle, the ultrasound captures the motion of that line over time and shows how the left ventricle moves throughout the cardiac cycle. In this graph, the upper line represents the interventricular septum, the lower line corresponds to the left ventricular free wall, and the distance between them indicates the internal dimension of the LV. 
From this M-mode tracing, you can assess key parameters of the left ventricle. LVIDD, or left ventricular internal dimension in diastole, helps evaluate left ventricular enlargement. LVIDS, or in systole, along with fractional shortening or FS, gives you insight into systolic function. In mitral regurgitation, blood leaks back into the left atrium and returns to the left ventricle, resulting in increased preload. To accommodate this volume overload, the left ventricle dilates and undergoes eccentric remodeling. In MMVD patients, this eccentric change can be evaluated using M-mode, particularly by measuring an increased diastolic internal dimension with a normal or thin-appearing wall. You should also evaluate the size of each ventricular chamber in this view. Normally, the right ventricular cavity is approximately one-third the size of the left ventricle. Before we dive deeper, let's take a quick overview of LV systolic function. When the cardiac systolic function maintained normally, the left ventricular chamber should return to its systolic size, regardless of normal diastolic dimension or enlarged left ventricle. Imagine a normal heart, where end diastolic diameter is 10 and end systolic diameter is 5. If the heart is volume overloaded and the end diastolic diameter increases to 15, but systolic function is still normal, the end systolic diameter should still return to 5. Even in an overloaded heart, if the systolic function is intact, the heart compensates by contracting more forcefully to maintain a normal systolic diameter. However, if systolic function is impaired, the LV chamber won't contract as effectively, and the end systolic diameter may only decrease to 8 instead of returning to normal. Therefore, if the systolic internal dimension of the LV is larger than normal, it suggests a reduced systolic function or impaired contractility. In addition, fractional shortening, or FS, is calculated from M-mode measurements and commonly used to assess LV systolic performance. However, in MMVD patients, volume overload can cause a falsely elevated FS, so interpretation should always consider the clinical context. You may wonder, why do we use the term systolic function instead of contractility when we describe echocardiographic findings? You might wonder, are these two terms interchangeable? In fact, they're not. Contractility is the intrinsic ability of the myocardium to contract, regardless of loading conditions. But unfortunately, it cannot be directly measured in clinical practice. So instead, we assess systolic function, which refers to the overall performance of the left ventricle during systole. However, systolic function is influenced by loading condition, such as preload, afterload, and heart rate. So when we assess systolic function using indicators like systolic left ventricular dimension and fractional shortening, we need to be careful not to assume reduced contractility too quickly. Instead, we should first consider whether changes in preload, afterload, or heart rate may be affecting the measurements. It's a bit tricky, right? But it's a key concept to truly understand echocardiography, so I hope you remember it well. Even if the myocardial contractility is normal, increased preload, can make systolic function look better. Increased afterload can make it look worse. So, when we interpret systolic indices like LV, IDS, and FS, we have to check preload and afterload. At this point, the most clinically relevant factor we need to consider as afterload is blood pressure. Blood pressure represents the resistance the left ventricle must overcome to eject blood. It directly affects stroke volume and the overall systolic performance. Let's think about this dinosaur walking. When it walks on a flat surface, it moves easily. But when it tries to walk up a steep slope, it slows down, even though its muscle strength has not changed. This is exactly what happens in the heart when afterload increases. The contractility of the myocardium might be normal, but the systolic function can appear reduced because the heart has to work against a higher resistance. So remember, decreased systolic function does not always mean decreased contractility. Now let's move to the level of the aortic valve. This view is commonly used to assess the left atrium to aorta ratio, which is an important index for evaluating left atrial enlargement. At end systole, the aortic diameter is measured from commissure to commissure, and the left atrial diameter is taken at its widest point like in this figure, 
a ratio of 1.6 or higher, suggests cardiac remodeling. This supports a diagnosis of stage B2 or higher in MMVD patients. So far, we've reviewed the key echocardiographic indices that should be evaluated from the right-sided scan in dogs with MMVD. In the next part, we'll focus on what to assess from the left-sided scan and how it contributes to staging and management. Let's summarize what we need to check from the right parasternal long axis view. First, from the four-chamber view, we evaluate the shape of the mitral valve during diastole, making sure the leaflets are opening properly. Second, we assess how the mitral valve closes during systole, looking carefully for any abnormal leaflet motion, such as prolapse or flail. Next, we evaluate the size of the left ventricular chamber and measure the wall thickness. These findings help us understand the degree of cardiac remodeling and workload. Then, we assess the position and motion of the interventricular septum. A displaced septum can suggest volume overload. Finally, we use color Doppler in both the four-chamber view and the LVOT view to detect mitral regurgitation. This helps visualize the direction, origin, and severity of abnormal backward flow during systole. Now moving to the right parasternal short axis view. At the papillary muscle level, we assess the symmetry of the left ventricular shape and uniform contraction. Then we perform M-mode evaluation. By measuring the left ventricular diastolic dimension, we can assess left ventricular enlargement. And also, by measuring the left ventricular systolic dimension and fractional shortening, we can estimate left ventricular systolic function. Finally, at the aortic valve level, we calculate the left atrium to aortic root ratio. This measurement is essential for detecting left atrial enlargement, a key indicator of MMVD disease progression. If you'd like to learn more about how to perform M-mode and Doppler-based measurements, make sure to check out our previous lecture, where we cover all the essential techniques and practical scanning tips. That concludes today's lecture. I hope this session helped you better understand the fundamentals of ultrasound imaging and interpretation. If you found this lecture useful, be sure to check out more educational content on Vet Image Lab, where we have a variety of lectures about veterinary diagnostic imaging. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next lecture. This was the first lecture in the MMVD series from Vet Image Lab. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell so you won't miss our upcoming lectures. See you in the next video.